And this great God is our God that we come together to worship together. We hear from his word, so true, so trustworthy. And so as we be prepared to do so, even as we did last week, I'm gonna ask you to do so again as I open God's word to read it. If you would stand for a moment in honor of God's word as I read from Romans chapter nine. I'm gonna read verse six through 33 and then pray and we will begin to open this up. We will look at it uh, from one angle and aspects of it this week and then we will take it up again next week looking at some more elements that are woven in there that time does not permit. You know, wrestling within myself, this could be done over an extended span of weeks, but looking to really summarize it in these two if we can. But listen as I read Romans chapter nine, verse six through 33. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we then say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scriptures say to Pharaoh, for this very reason I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name, might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he then still find fault, for who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? In order to make known the riches of his glory, for vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. For indeed, he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in every place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? And that that is a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law that would not lead, or that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Whoever believes in him 
will not be put to shame. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we just call out to you and I ask you that you would be with us in this next hour and that you would bless us. Grant God that I would speak concisely and clearly. I pray that you by your spirit would give understanding and clarity to your word. Lord, we thank you for the fullness of its truth, the reliableness of all that it says. Lord, please help us to lay hold of these things that we might understand more fully, the mercy and the grace that is ours in Christ. Oh God, that you would humble our hearts and souls as we stand amazed at your electing grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Even as you are, that was a lot to read, even just in terms of the reading. And hopefully as I read it, already you were seeing and hearing many things woven within that passage. Now this Romans chapter 9 is not a common passage that many have heard preached. Many a Christian will traverse the totality of their lifetime and never hear a sermon from Romans chapter 9. The reason why is that, at least as it will oft be presented by some, they'll say Romans 9 is a very controversial passage. Romans 9 is very hard to understand, and since it's a controversial and difficult passage, we'll move past it and focus on those things where we can be encouraged and where we are blessed, and etc. But here's the reality. We believe that every word in the scripture is given by inspiration of God. We believe that every word here is not accidental. Romans chapter 9, God did not accidentally leave it in the scriptures for our confusion. He has delivered it to us for our clarity. And I would dare say that those who have set it aside have chosen confusion instead of clarity because this book is set aside actually not because it's hard to understand but because it is hard to accept as you read this chapter it seems very clear what it is saying but what it is saying is so at contrast from our normal human way of thinking which ought not be a surprise since God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts, so it should not surprise us that this is a challenge for us to put the pieces together in our mind. Uh, uh, or, or, and secondarily, it's, it's very humbling and it, and it lays everything out to show that God is almighty and has always exercised his sovereign rights and his divine choice to accomplish his divine will. And it has always been like that throughout the scripture and continues to be like that with regard to the salvation of men. And it is very important for us to understand what is going on in this chapter. Now, as a side note, The predicted weather for today is extremely warm. Already by noon, it will be too hot for any of you to even want to go outside. So we may continue and just carry on as I protect you from the weather outside. What do you think? No. We'll do our best to consider what we can, but as often is the case when we engage God's truth, uh, words have limits. You know, and time is limited, but truth is clear and truth prevails. So I want us to begin to look at this. And as we take up this chapter, for those who have a worship folder, there's a little bit of an outline on the back. And we're going to look at, I've titled this sermon, God's Purpose of Election. Remember, it says this very clearly in Romans chapter 9, verse 11. And this is, within Romans 9, 11, we have a very clear purpose 
purpose statement. A purpose statement is that which the things uh, before it contribute to and those things after it expound upon. This is the main thought and theme that is being unpacked in Romans chapter 9. It says, Though they, speaking of the twins, were born and had done neither good or bad, listen to what it says, in order that, that is an introducing a purpose statement. This happened. This is the history of the birth and the divine selection that God engaged. And the purpose of all these historic events was in order that God's purpose of election might continue or might stand. And well, what do you mean by God's purpose of election? Well, let me unpack it a little bit for you just by reading the next line. Not, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Wait a second. So are you ultimately saying everything with regard to salvation history depends upon the unique divine call of God? Well, that's what I read, and I want to unpack it a little further. Remember, in this context, as we're trying to understand what's going on, back in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, it, it said these words, verse 32 and 33, He, that is God, did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also uh, with him graciously give us all things? Who can bring a charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies. So again, the context here is election. And I will say this, somewhere, sometime, someplace, you're going to come across someone who's going to say, those people believe in election. <laughs> you know, or those people believe in predestination. It's very, very common. But the reality is, um, who will bring a charge against God's elect so that God's purpose of election might continue? So listen closely. Everybody who believes the word of God believes in election. They may understand it differently and they may define it deficiently or differently, but, but realistically, everyone has to believe in election or they have to throw out their Bibles, which they ought never do because this is the word of God. And it says these things and, and it, it sometimes it makes people uncomfortable, but the scripture does not present it to make us uncomfortable unless you're uncomfortable to remember that God's amazing grace saved a wretch like you. And a wretch like me. Oh, it's a lot easier to sing than it is for you to actually call me that. Yes, but that's what the scriptures reminds us. He had mercy on us. If he was to leave us in our sin, we've already learned in Romans, what's the natural condition of men? There's none who are righteous. No, not one. So when you were starting to think of somebody, you were wrong. No one is, except, of course, the Son of God who came and fulfilled all righteousness and pleased his Father and everything. But there's none who's righteous. No, not one. There is no one who understands. So you tell them the gospel. You tell them the salvation. You tell them the words of grace. And as it says in 1 Corinthians, the natural man does not accept the things of God. Their foolishness to him he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned then it goes on to even to dare say no one seeks after God we have all together become worthless how dare you again I'm quoting scripture you know, if the scripture says things that we never paid attention to, the shame is on us. And even when it explains who we were by nature, the shame is on us. But it is God who had mercy on us. 
And actually, all of those glorious terms, mercy and grace, don't mean anything if we were all together valuable. He who was worthy gave himself for the unworthy. He who was righteous gave himself for the unrighteous. We who were at at enmity and hostility, he reconciled us to him and made us no long, not simply acceptable, but adopted and members of the household of God. What a remarkable thing that goes on. But note this, the idea that God in himself will decide for himself whatever he decides and men just have to accept What God decides is really tough to modern Americans living in a democratic republic. But it's even hard to natural man. Let me give you a brief example as we begin to unpack this. In the book of Numbers 16, and I'm pretty sure you already know what I'm about to bring up, or not, you know, in, in number 16, you have God has distinguished Moses that he would speak to and Aaron who would be his priest and Aaron's sons who would be the priest. And they were uniquely set apart, Moses, to speak to God face to face and then speak to the people and Aaron to represent the people in the Holy of Holies before God and nobody else gets to go there. Nobody else gets to see it. Nobody else has any part in that except Moses and Aaron and the others don't. To which the hearts of men quickly begin to do what? That's not fair. Well, you know, I, I, he's no better than me. Well, when it comes to God's electing mercy on us, that's an absolute fact. He's no better than me. Actually, sometimes, humanly speaking, he's way better than me. (laughs) But God had mercy on me in spite of me. And, And so these men gathered together, Korah, it's called Korah's Rebellion, Korah and Dotham and Abiram, they joined together uh, these uh, curious names and they say, no way, us too. You guys, how dare you? And Moses kind of was like, it wasn't us. This is what God decided. And and this is the way that it's stated. Numbers chapter 16, verse three into five, having given you the background, they assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far for all the congregation is holy, every one of them. Uh, Now, I wish they would have thought that through. (laughs) Again, now they were holy in a sense that they were separated from and distinguished from all the other families and peoples of the earth. In that sense, they were holy, set apart. But in terms of like actual holy, moral holiness, no. But please note this, you've got to be careful when you wrestle with the Old Testament because There was a, if somebody, for example, was to touch the clothes of a priest who had offered a sacrifice, they would become holy. Now, that didn't mean they suddenly became morally righteous and began to radiate shining essence. That's that's not what it is. It, It was, you know, they were... Because they touched that, they were set apart. They had to now really conduct themselves with exceeding care and distinctiveness. And in other things they might touch, they were not holy, but they were unclean. And because they touched that dead carcass, they can't even attend some of the worship and some of the sacrifices and some of the events because they're determined as unclean. Just by touching that. All those kinds of things to show... God decides everything. And a lot of them would say, scratch their heads, why this doesn't make sense to me. Well, what doesn't make sense to you is why God did it that way. 
But what part of unclean did you not understand? And what part of holy did you not understand? Well, I understand what it's saying, but I don't know why. Yeah, that's all right. Because it's probable we can't understand the why. Because we're just men. We're just human beings. And he goes on to say, you've gone too far to all the congregations, holy, every one of them. The Lord is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves among the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he said to Korah and all his company, in the morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, set apart for this purpose, and bring him near. The one whom he chooses, he will bring near. That just puts everything in its place, doesn't it? You know, and Dotham's like, but I want it to be me. I think it should be me. I'm just as good. Let's, let's have a vote among the children of Israel who it ought to be. Listen, he might win a vote of men, but the selection and the purposes have nothing to do with the will of men. God declares, God decides, God determines, that's it. And of course, you probably are aware of what ultimately happened. The earth opened up and swallowed Korah and his family whole, like, a, like an earth mouth, and gone something that had never happened before, showing the distinctive purposes and power of God. So it does, so again, that's why when Paul later on says, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? A lot of people get offended. And when preachers reread that, they're like, I felt like that was a little, a little condescending. Um, well, again, it's not the preacher who's coming up with these things, hopefully. It is, it is the apostle inspired by the Holy Spirit of God so that we would be put in our place. And in the midst of all that, Moses understood what was his place. You think I'm making much of myself? I fall on my face. I'm nothing. I'm low. But God makes the choices. So powerful these things are. And we're going to, I can't wait till we get to Romans chapter 11, where even God there himself, when, when telling about some of the events that took place uh, in the days of old, says that he spoke to the prophet and said, I have kept for myself 7,000 who did not bend the knee to Baal or Baal, to the idol. Now, what's interesting is, from our angle, yeah, they didn't bend the knee, solid men. But then the scripture tells us, why did they not bend the knee? Because God kept them for himself. Hmm. But what if they wanted to worship the idol? All right. Why are we so worried about what men want? You know, God divest us of our desires and fill us with a delight in you and in the truth. The last thing we want is to be a slave to our whims and wants. And so uh, again in here. Now, uh, so let's, let's, let's just dive in because I feel like I could spend all day um, in this. God's chosen plan, the first point there is to salvation. There are some dear, well-intended individuals who will say, Romans 9 is not about salvation. Romans 9 is about the Jews and God's plan for the Jews. God uses his hand upon the Jews in their history as an example of his purposes in salvation. Why are you somehow mistaking that which is given as the example, as the end all, 
That's not where it's going. And, and we're going to see how the scriptures make that very clear. Again, slightly reviewing from last week, beginning in verse 6. First of all, when it comes to the word of God, when it comes to the promises of God, when it comes to the truth of God, it is not as though the word of God has failed. Because how many times does the word of God fail? None and never. The, the word here for uh, uh, failing, it, it, it's, it's an interesting term. Its history carries two main uses before it developed into broader sense. One would be when uh, the uh, petals of a flower fall off and they're not, no longer where they're supposed to be. They've fallen off. The other was when a, shri- a ship would drift off course. God's word never drifts off course. It never misses the direction. It never misses the mark. It's never not where it's supposed to be. It never uh, loses its, its efficacy, loses its strength. It, 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 it never becomes weakened or dilapidated or decaying. It's the word of God. As we kind of looked at earlier this morning, we could go so far as to say the word of the Lord remains forever. And we love the the promises in Proverbs 30, verse five and six. Every word of the Lord proves true and he is a shield to those who take refuge in him. I always want to remind you of what it says after that when it says every word of the Lord proves true. He follows that up by saying, do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Well, look, there's a 50-50 chance I'm right in what I added. Uh, No, there's not. (laughs) Because his ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. Whenever you add anything, you've gone wrong. The reason why you should not add is because all of your additions, all of my additions, are going to be flawed additions. The word of God is that which proves true. The word of God, his words, Psalm 12, 6, are pure words, like silver refined in the furnace on the ground purified seven times. Not only is his word uh, uh, sure, true and trustworthy, but they're also powerful and potent and effective. We're told in Isaiah 55, verse 11, so shall my word be. Had given the example of rain and growth, etc. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall or will accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Which means what? Every word of God is true, and every time his word goes forward, it effectively accomplishes and succeeds. And someone would say, well, no, it didn't, because I quoted the word of God to my unbelieving neighbor, and they were not saved. Your confusion is that you think that the plan of God is to save everyone and you don't understand God's electing purposes, God's distinguishing distinctive will. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And we're gonna unpack those things in a little bit. It it may be that the day appointed for your neighbor's salvation simply isn't today. That, That it is yet to come in the days ahead. Or it may be that they may never believe and that the word of God is simply serving to condemn them in their sin and hold them accountable for judgment. But listen, it always accomplishes and succeeds in the purpose for which it was sent. If God's purpose is to use it to save that person, you know what happens? They are saved. If it, is, if it is to condemn them and harden them in their sin, then do you know what happens? They are further condemned and hardened. Wait, 
Are you trying to say that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and he will harden whomever he hardens? Uh, that's what I read. At what point do we think what we read is not true, is not trustworthy, is not reliable? It's, it, it may be different than the way we've always approached the world and, and, and the practice of religion, but that's only because somebody's hidden these from us. You know? But I'm pretty sure everybody's Bible has Romans chapter 9. Pretty sure everybody's Bible has Ephesians chapter 1. I'm pretty sure everybody's Bible has these things, so you can't blame somebody else just for hiding these things from you. All right, so we see the, the word of God is faithful and never fails. We also see in the context of this, he's unpacking some confusing things throughout the old covenant in God's unfolding history. It seemed that the design of God was uh, uh, the special relationship with the nation of Israel. And then he's gonna begin to say things under the new covenant in Christ that are confusing. He's gonna say, not all Israel are Israel. Like, what? Yeah. I mean, it's just like, where's he going with this? And this is important to know this because it ends up, we get confused in our minds. Sometimes people think, see, God's plan is hard, everything it was for Israel, you know, and he tried his best and Jesus did his best and all, but they rejected him. And so what God had wanted and intended just didn't work out. And so, because they rejected it, God said, oh, okay, let's go to the Gentiles because, uh, you know, and we'll do something with them for a while and, uh, and, and then we'll, get, we'll turn our attention back to the Jews, that, you know, and it's like, what? God tried? God is not a God of mere effort. Come on. You know, that's, that was his plan, but... My goodness, it just didn't work out. That's us. That's not him. His plan all along was intended to point us towards the person of Christ. Christ, ultimately, we will see. He's the fulfillment of the promises of Abraham. He is the, he is the fulfillment of the promises of Judah and the one who will sit upon that throne. He is the fullest representation of, of Israel. In him, the promises, the covenants, they all find their yea and their amen. And sometimes we, we, we think that God was scrambling with a fix-it plan. Not realizing, wait, God's plan was firm and fixed all along and it was fixed upon his son. And it was fixed upon those whom he in eternity past had given to his son to accomplish his saving purposes. Let's, let's go ahead and see if we can unpack some of this. It was Romans 9, 6 that said, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Galatians 3 6 helps us understand that because it says this just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness know then this is Galatians 3 7 know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham now some people will come in and say nah you can't say that you can't come in and, and, and give a different definition. I said, and I would say to them, you are absolutely right. I cannot. I have no right. No man has any right. But if God comes in and declares to us that the, the design and definition, even when he set apart Abraham in the past, was intended not for those who are descendants by the flesh, but was intended to those who would share the faith of Abraham. Who am I to then say, nope, no, you can't do that. You can't do that, Spirit of God? Okay, no, that's not acceptable. Further, it goes on to even say in Galatians 3, 9, 
in case we didn't get how clear, it, verse seven that said, no then it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham, which I don't know how it could be said more clearly. But verse nine says it like this. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Okay, so we are Abraham's descendants and all and the blessings that were promised to him were ultimately not designed as unfolding on the flesh, but unfolding according to faith. Okay, I begin to see these things. So how does this find its fuller fulfillment? Well, look at Galatians 3.16. The promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say offsprings, referring to many, which means the promises even given to Abraham weren't necessarily for Isaac and Jacob and all the patriarchs and all those descended from him. It says offspring, and even in the original declaration of God, it had singular and specific intent. What was that? does not say offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. Hmm. So the promises came to Christ and then we are united to Christ by faith and by being united to Christ by faith, being those of faith, we are the sons of Abraham. Being united to Christ, we are the sons of God. How glorious is that? And it unpacks that as it says it in Galatians 3.16. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, or really that word there is to the nations, to all of them, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Well, what about these promises that, that, are, that are spoken of in here? How do I know that what Romans 9 ultimately is talking about is salvation? Hmm. Look with me briefly, if you would, in verse 24. As you make your way to 24, you have just passed by verse uh, 23 that speaks of vessels of mercy prepared for glory. And it says this, who are these vessels of mercy prepared for glory? The Jews thought it would only and always be exclusively them, but the scriptures say, no, no, no. Even though they will number more than the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. So then who is the promises to? Well, it is all those in Christ. Verse 24, even us whom he has called. Not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Again, noting this, the distinguishing thing with regard to the promises and the inheritance stated here, whether Jew or non-Jew, the one ultimately distinguishing thing is the call of God. Those whom he calls, he justifies. Those whom he justifies, he glorifies. It puts it all on God. And it's powerful when it unpacks us and then he goes further. Uh, indeed, does he not say, in, in, now, now to understand that this calling is a calling unto salvation, uh, which again from Romans 8 should be clear, justified, glorified, but we're gonna still see the immediate passage in uh, verse 25. As he indeed said in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call, my people and her who was not beloved I will call beloved and in the very place where it said to them you are not my people they will be called what sons of the living God now this is all the outcome of what God calling from the Jews and from the nations not my people my people not beloved, beloved. Instead of children of the world, even sons of darkness, now sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. So what is the, what ultimately is the election that's being spoken of in Romans chapter 9? Be saved. Elect unto salvation. 
called unto salvation by the mighty grace of God. Oh, how, well, what, even further, down in verse 30, Romans 9, 30, what then shall we say? The nations, Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. Now listen, if in the calling of God we're justified, declared righteous, we've attained righteousness, a righteousness that is by faith, how is that not talking about salvation? Right? Because we are declared righteous, that is for the purposes of judgment, we are not declared unrighteous and judged for our sin. Further, it says in verse 33, Behold, I have laid and laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him, that is Christ, will not be put to shame. We see that wonderful, wonderful unfolding purposes. Best we can, let's unpack a few things. This passage not only is about election in those ways and about the effectiveness and efficiency of God's word and God's calling, which is clear, but to give an example of that, scripture tells us here God chose Abraham. First of all, see, uh, 9 7 is going to say, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. So, not all Israel is Israel. Not all of Abraham's kids are his kids. What? I mean, you seem to be defying language and logic. Well, what it's explaining to us here is the difference between flesh and faith. The difference bet between the material and the spiritual. Very, very clearly. So let's go ahead and see this uh, as he speaks of, and, and, and all of this is designed. How do I know that's what it means? Look what verse eight, it, but through, I'm still in verse seven. Because they are his offspring, not all are his children because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your children, your offspring be named. God did that in the Old Testament in order to teach this lesson. This means, because you might say, well, what does this mean? This means it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. And it's important to even know with that, uh, Nehemiah 9, 7 tells us this, you are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. Now I like that because oftentimes when we read those stories, we look at it and say, um, God spoke to him and uh, Abraham, he said, go from your family and your kindred and Abraham went. You know, so Abraham he went, he exercised his will, he carried out the action, so because he did, he got. That's the way we say it. But listen to what the scriptures say in Nehemiah 9. It says, the Lord God chose Abraham and brought him out. Wait a second. In our viewing of the story, he went. He went by his choice and desire to obey. This passage says God brought him out. So which is it? Did God bring him out or did he go willingly? I asked the question wrongly. Right? Because why did he go out willingly? Because God brought him out. Because God's way of bringing out isn't just like a, 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 a carrot and a donkey, you know? It's just not like treats and snacks for the doggy. Come, come, come. No, it is nothing like that. It is God working within us that we will both will and work for his good pleasure. Takes what would be self-serving desires, doubts and fears. I don't know what will happen. I don't know where we're going. I'm not sure. And he puts within us a yearning, a desire, and a delight. And we do because he does. You know, 
took me forever to learn this, sadly. But the scriptures are clear. In Genesis 18, speaking of the, this, it says, um, verse 19, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord doing righteousness so that the Lord may bring uh, to him, to Abraham, what is promised him. I've chosen him, I'm gonna work within him, and I'm gonna carry out my promise. And then we learn from Galatians that promise ultimately centered in on Jesus Christ. And then it overflows from him to those who are united to Christ by faith. Oh, God chose Abraham. God chose Isaac. Verse 9 and 10 says, uh, for this is what the promise said about this time next year. I, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but so, so listen again. With God's choosing of Isaac, it, it's important to note this. Abraham was a hundred years old. You know, with, without being uh, uh, crass or unthoughtful, he says, yeah, my days are done. You know, uh, I, I'm not, no longer medically efficient at procreation. That's what he's saying. And then he speaks of his wife also, and uh, her cycles have ceased she's done with her childbearing years and capacity which effectively means curiously abraham has not the ability to produce offspring sarah has not the ability to produce offspring and yet what is going to happen they will have offspring you know. and, and the answer to that, you're not supposed to be, wow, Abraham, his vitality and virility just lasted longer than most. And, uh, and, and Sarah, no, if that's your conclusion, you're missing it all together. Because the answer is to sit back and say, there would be no child apart from the promise that is fulfilled by miraculous power. And then we realize, wait, we who have faith in Christ are, the, are children of the promise. And that is not because we contributed or produced anything ourselves. But in very much the same way, the one who made the promise exercised his power miraculously in bringing something from nothing. So that we might say regarding those who are saved. Well then, who can be saved, the apostles say, if the rich can't be saved? And, and, then, then who can? And Jesus' answer was simple, wasn't it? What is impossible with men? Wait a second. I mean, it, it almost is, so, so are you going to try to say it depends not on human will? or exertion, but on God who has mercy? Well, actually, that's exactly what Romans 9 says. It depends not on human will. We are what we are by the power of the promise of God set upon us in Christ before the foundation of the world, and all of his promises will be fulfilled, and that which was absolutely impossible, he has miraculously accomplished. And that is... Um, so blessed. And now we move on. God elected or chose Jacob. So it got, God chose Abraham, and then Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac, but no, 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 Ishmael, not for you. Isaac is the one that's going to be through the, that the offspring will be named through, that ultimately would be the line that would lead to Jesus. Right? And then uh, the next would be that uh, Isaac would father, same father, same mother, same birthday. And God would still make selective distinction. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. 
And we often say, why? Well, why? Well, just he even answers that. Before either of them had done good or evil, so that God's purpose of election might stand. It had nothing to do with them, and even those of us who have studied the life of uh, Jacob, who then became Israel, God chose him not because of his worthiness, right? Sort of defrauding his brother out of the birthright, you know, pretending to be sheepskin arms, wearing his brother's clothes so that he would have the feel and scent, which seems unpleasant, of his brother and deceive his father. And his father would say, you got the smell and the touch of, but the sound of your voice, are you really? And he lies. He deceives. And so you think, is he, is, oh, he, he proved worthy of God's election. There is no one who is worthy. That's the whole point of election. No one is worthy and none would be saved and none would seek after God. None would be made whole. None would, no hope is there. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the love with which he loved us in Christ before the foundation of the world saw fit to save us. They had done neither good or evil. And, and, and ultimately, if you want to talk about what God would foresee in them, evil for both of them. And I say this lovingly, what God foresaw in you and me, evil. Right? The, we, we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Those who are accustomed to doing evil, can they do good? Yeah, no easier than a leopard can change its spots. It does not happen. And so, it, so it, it puts us in that position of hopelessness and shows us God's own divine selection. And he says there, uh, quoting from the Old Testament, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And a lot of us say, well, that's not fair. And some will even go so far as to say, well, God loves everybody, so that let's just ignore that verse altogether. Well, you know, or they'll say, well, you know, it doesn't mean hated. It means loved less or differently. You're still talking about differing and distinguishing love of God. One kind of love given to one and that kind of love withheld from the other. You're not escaping. <laughs> what, because there's, and here's the, the curiosity. Why are you trying to escape rather than trying to understand anyway? Right? Because the beauty of it is you sit back and say, not because of me or anything in me, anything that I would or could do, but all because of the grace and mercy of God. He would have been right to hate me. He would have been right and just to harden me, but he chose to make me a trophy of his mercy and grace. Though unworthy, Christ in love redeemed me and made me his own. Oh, what an amazing thing. And again, we're going to uh, uh, see how that sort of concludes. He elected, God chose who is not and who is reckoned Israel or saved. Galatians 3.22 says this. Scripture imprisoned everything under sin. You read the scripture, you realize that's where everybody is, under sin. Uh, Romans states it this way. Everyone is in prison under sin so that everyone's mouth would be stopped. I got nothing to boast. I got nothing to contribute. I got nothing to offer. You know, we've, we've talked about that example before. What does the scripture say are the best deeds of sinful man? All of our righteousness are as? Filthy rags. Oh yeah, here's what I have to offer you. You know, pockets full of stinky rags. Oh, that commends me, you know. I wait, don't worry, I've got more. Well, don't, don't add to that. You know, I don't want any of your stinking rags. You got nothing that I want, even indeed nothing that I need. He has everything that we need. 
and he is the one who opens our eyes so that now we know and want it. Until he opens our eyes, we don't know the beauty and the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so the scriptures unpack these things and and in different ways, and our time is running low, so I'll just draw your attention to um, Philippians 3, 3 through following. Writing to the Gentile church at Philippi, he says this, we are the circumcision, which is a linguistic way of saying we're the real Jews, because he said in Romans 2, those who are circumcised but then don't keep the law, their circumcision will be regarded as uncircumcision. So they're Jew but not considered Jew. And then it says those who are uncircumcised but, as we know by the working of grace, obey the commandments of God, their uncircumcision will be regarded as circumcision so Jew not Jew not Jew Jew huh yeah and he says again to the Philippians the we are the circumcision we are the the people of God we are the distinctive ones and and what how does he define that who worship by the Spirit of God in the glo- in Christ and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. You know what it has nothing to do with? Our history, our lineage has nothing to do with our flesh or our blood. It has to do with the grace of God as he has mercy on whom he will have mercy and sending his spirit to us, granting us that we might believe, turning us from self and sin to serve the true and living God and we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. United with him by faith, we are the sons of God. We are brought by grace to worship in the spirit of God and glory in God. Christ Jesus we are the circumcision we're the ones thusly regarded and our time is finished and I only had about 30 more verses that emphasize these things (laughs) but even as I say that these would simply deepen emphasize reiterate what we've already I hope seen clearly right God is a God of absolute authoritative power. Men are weak and wicked and unworthy. But God still amazingly did not leave us as what we were. Paul looked at what he was, Jewish, all the righteous deeds of the law, and what did he come to recognize that it all really was? Rubbish. God did not leave us for what we were, but redeemed us, reconciled us to him, set his love on us, made us his treasured possession, his peculiar people, all by his grace and his grace alone so that we are the household of God. We are the people of God. We are the Israel of God because we are united to Christ by faith. Amen. So as we see those things, the chosen plan unto salvation, God's word never fails. The flesh has nothing to do with fulfillment. The fuller fulfillment is bound up in Christ and those who are united to Christ by faith. We are the beloved. We are his people. We are sons of the living God. We are saved. Even as God, for his own purposes and by his own power, chose Abraham. And then God chose Isaac. And God chose Jacob in at times logic and defying ways. And we thought then, oh, the descendancy comes uh, uh, by the flesh from them. We come to realize, no, they weren't chosen to teach you a lesson about God's design for a historic earthly people. They were chosen that you would understand God's electing power. That he has been pleased 
to set upon all of those who have faith in Christ. And all of the promises of God, all of the hope for eternity is ours in him. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for the time that we've been able to have here together this morning. It always seems that time is insufficient and fleeting, but I pray that you'll be pleased to take the sort of summary overview that we've looked at this morning and you would bring it home to the hearts of your people in so doing that you would humble us greatly and you would be lifted high that you would be exalted in our eyes, that we would understand who you truly are. And you are the King of kings and Lord of lords and we give to you all praise and honor, even in recognition of that. We sing of your worthiness. Lord, I pray for those who you gathered here this morning that you would be with them. I pray for those among us, many of whom whom are traveling or even struggling with health uh, circumstances today. God, may you be with them where they are. Bless them in their walk with you. Continue to help us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.